in the 16th century. Explorers such as Vasquez de Coronado, Ponce de Leon, Oñate, and others moved through Mexico into North America in search of fabled wealth and routes to the Orient. In their wake, Spanish presidios, missions, and villages were established throughout what is today the American Southwest. Hispanos, settling along the Rio Grande, were isolated and surrounded by Native Americans who ruled the region. Mutual cooperation and trade developed between Indians and Hispanos. But not all relations with Native Americans were peaceful. Nomadic tribes threatened New Mexican villages and missions. Insecurity and hardship characterized the lives of many on the Spanish frontier. Santa Fe, the isolated capital of the northern frontier, had been dependent for centuries upon Spanish trade. El Camino Real wound a thousand dangerous miles to Mexico City. Once in three years, a small supply train traveled north on this royal highway, bearing much needed goods and supplies to the struggling settlers at the edge of the Spanish Empire. If we do not make one kingdom of all of this, nothing is secure. Joseph de Zuniga y Cerda, 1704. By the late 18th century, the greatest threat to the Spanish frontier was intrusion by foreigners, attempts by the French and later the Americans to establish trade ties with New Mexicans were forbidden by mercantilist Spain. Fuego! In 1821, thousands of miles to the south of Santa Fe, Mexican rebels wander independence from Spain. In the spring of that same year, startling news made the 1,600-mile journey north to Santa Fe. A Spanish officer boldly declared Mexico's independence from the throne of Spain. Months later, a horseman arrived in Santa Fe with the news that New Mexicans must take an oath of allegiance to the Mexican Republic. I guess we could go back to 1821, to the uh, uh, independence from, from Spain, because that was uh, pivotal. Spain's policies, of course, were mercantilist. In other words, uh, uh, merchants could not trade outside the em empire. The New Mexico merchants were at a real disadvantage because the Chihuahua traders that were coming up from Mexico were subsidized by Mexico and the New Mexicans they were not subsidized by anything and they had to, you know, a, a more difficult situation. So after independence, uh, it opened the way for the Santa Fe Trail, you know, because immediately they could, they could begin cr crossing over to the, uh, as, as traders and as men of commerce in, 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 into uh, you know, St. Louis and Missouri and Kansas. And it, it was an, an opportunity uh, f for the New Mexico traders. And on the other hand, it was, it was a real asset also for the United States because they found ready-made uh, uh, brokers, so to speak, that would connect um, the United States trade with the larger Latin American possibilities. Mexican independence 
profoundly affected this province, for Mexico opened its borders for the first time to trade from the burgeoning country to the east. Many New Mexicans believed free trade with Los Americanos, or Los Estranjeros, as they were called, would only bring benefits, and they welcomed it. No longer dependent upon Spain, New Mexico was exposed to foreign ideas and commerce, which marked both a beginning and an end. The story of America's West and Mexico's north cannot be told separately. The first half of the 19th century saw Americans extend their ideals of freedom westward. Wagons rolled down the Santa Fe Trail, and with each turn of the wheel, the fate of nations changed. Captain Becknell of Missouri, with four trusty companions, went out to Santa Fe by the far western prairie route with its original purpose of trading with the Ayatan or Comanche Indians. But having fallen accidentally with a party of Mexican rangers, they were easily prevailed upon to accompany them to the new emporium, where they realized a very handsome prophet, Josiah Gregg. Becknell and his friends spread their goods out on the hard-packed sod of the Santa Fe Plaza, and within a few hours, they'd sold everything they brought over the Santa Fe Trail, and in place of the goods they'd carried, they uh, had stacks of milled Spanish dollars to take back to Missouri. With Becknell coming into Santa Fe and making such a tremendous profit, the story is when he came back to Arrow Rock, he dropped his coin on the cobblestone and the sound rang forever. Not only did the West open up for the United States, but the East opened up for Mexico. Now you've got an open frontier between two societies that have been separated by law for hundreds of years. They'd been enemies who had um, fought to the death over God, and particularly God, as well as government. Becknell did not just open a profitable road of commerce. He also opened a trail that would be forever associated with the myth, adventure, and conquest of the West. But to see a grass o'er which our wagons roll, we'll reach the Arkansas at last and good old Mexico. Independence, the great rendezvous of the Santa Fe and Mountain Traders, a wild and daring troop. All his life in bustle, packing and purchasing and loading wagons, jabbering in Dutch, higgling in Spanish, swearing in bad French. Everywhere hurry, everywhere excitement. Richard Wilson. At last, all are fairly launched upon the broad prairie. The miseries of preparation are over. The charioteer, as he smacks his whip, feels a bounding elasticity of soul within him, which he finds it impossible to restrain. Josiah Gregg. Each morning, we awoke, rested, and the camp was astir at daybreak. There, stretched out before us, was a new coin day 
a fresh minted world under a glorious turquoise sky. Packing was done swiftly and the mules hitched to the wagons. Then the children were counted and loaded. Drivers were calling, get up there, come along boys. Bull whips were cracking and all about the heavy wagons began groaning. The mules leaned into the collar and the great wheels began a steady creaking. Mary and Russell, 1852. The Santa Fe Trail grew out of the earliest tracks of the buffalo and the Indians who hunted them. Out of the trapper's quest for furs and out of the American pioneer's unending curiosity, restlessness, and desire for adventure and wealth. The trip to Santa Fe was a perilous journey of nearly a thousand miles. Hunger, thirst, blazing heat, bitter cold, and the unknown were their lot. The journey took them across a boundless sea of prairie, over mountains and through rivers, amid wild beasts and among wilder men. Nor was there a road, not even a trail, anywhere across the famous plain. This tract of country may truly be styled the Grand Prairie Ocean, for not a single landmark is to be seen for more than 40 miles, scarcely a visible eminence by which to direct one's course. All is level as the sea, and the compass was our surest as well as principal guide. Josiah Gregg, 1844. Noon out on the wide prairie, and the sun, it seems, is exerting himself. Not a breath of air is stirring, and everything is scorching with heat. We have no water, and the animals are panting with thirst. Susan Shelby McGoffin, 1846. On reaching the narrow ridge which separates the Osage and Kansas waters, known as the Narrows, we encountered a region of troublesome quagmires. It is quite common for a wagon to sink to the hubs in mud. To extricate each other's wagons, we had frequently to employ double and triple teams with all hands to the wheels. Josiah Gregg, 1844. It was undoubtedly an adventure. I think the, the key word is probably exotic at the time, or at least, or at least it seemed exotic to some people. Uh, leaving, let's say, the Independence uh, area, the, the Western Missouri area, moving into uh, into the Southwest, mores were different, social customs were different, foods were different, music was different, uh, and if you read things like Josiah Gregg or or uh, Susan McGoffin, it becomes very clear that these people are moving into a real kind of cultural terra incognita. It's uh, it's all new to them. We nooned it at a small creek. While there, we had a visit from an Indian of the Ka tribe. They are a friendly nation. He stayed to dinner, eating, I believe, in both camps, and left the ground when we did. His tribe are wanderers over this part of the prairie, and often meet and eat with the traders. His horse, dog, and rifle were his companions. He smoked his pipe while we were preparing dinner, and watched with a scrutinizing eye Susan Shelby McGoffin, 1846. The Santa Fe Trail is not unlike a lot of other events or eras in history and that had an impact on, on my ancestors and my kind of people. And in this particular era, it was probably at least 30 or 40 separate tribes ranging from the Osage, the Oto, the Missouri, on this end, to the Tiwas and the Pueblos and the Tewas uh, and the Terras in, in New Mexico. I mean, there was anywhere from 20, 30, 40 separate tribes. When the 19th century opened, there was already a legacy of uh, strong feeling about Native Americans. In fact, Native Americans had already been described before the Americans landed in the New World. And for him, there was a kind of sense of the primitive, that that Indian whom he had not met was something like an Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. 
And that description was primarily by people who had not met Native Americans and had not been in the New World. They planned policy, uh, they carried out policy, and they carried out their lives based on that false philosophy. The viewpoint of the Euro-American or the European was of an open land, land that was there for the taking because they looked at the Indians and they saw that they were not plowing the land, they were not building up fences, they were not putting up the same kinds of dwellings, they were not farming, they were not doing the kinds of things that they normally associated with civilization. Your Americans saw timber, they saw limestone, they saw gold, they saw things that they could use to enrich themselves, things that they could use to make themselves comfortable, uh, but mostly things that could, they could use to incorporate into their sense of materialism, sense of ownership and possession. Not that Indians didn't have any ideas about ownership or possession, but since they lived so close to the natural environment, they, over you know, many thousands of generations, realized that they were part of that environment, a very real part. They were no better or no worse or, than any other being that existed within that environment. So when they looked at that environment, they saw something different. They saw a place that they were a part of. They saw things that were related to them. But as time went on and the people who lived here realized that their lives, their territory, the, the, the things that they depended on to live and associated with in their everyday existence were being slowly encroached upon. For example, the bison was a staple of life to the people in, here in this part of the country and in Northern Plains as well. Corridor, it was 10, 15 miles wide, and the, the people who traveled along it uh, literally scared off the bison. And it got to a point where there was a, a series of conflicts that the, the Cheyenne called the war to save the buffalo. Because the thinking was that if they got rid of these people, got rid of this corridor, then the buffalo would come back because the buffalo was that important to them. And once the buffalo were gone, then the staples that it provided, food, shelter, and clothing, all of the basic requirements of life was gone. And it is greatly to be feared that the traders were not always innocent of having instigated the savage hostilities that ensued in after years. These wanton cruelties had a most disastrous effect upon the prospects of the trade, for the exasperated children of the desert became more and more hostile and continued to wage a cruel war for many successive years. Josiah Gregg, 1844. They tried to stem the flow of non-native peoples. Uh, there were conflicts, there were battles, there were bloody battles. Imagine our consternation and dismay when upon descending into the valley of the Cimarron on the morning of the 19th of June, a band of Indian warriors on horseback suddenly appeared from behind the ravines. There was no merriment in this. It was a genuine alarm. These warriors, however, as we soon discovered, were only the vanguard of a countless host who were by this time pouring over the opposite ridge and galloping directly toward us. Josiah Gregg, 1844. So well, one side saw the Santa Fe Trail as one of the benchmarks of the progress of their civilization. The people who were already here saw it at the very least as a nuisance and at the very worst as an invasion. Part of you sighted a schooner Way back on the Santa Fe train They may get air Monday sooner With the water keg tied on the tail There was Ma and Pa and Little Mussy 
Somewhere alongside the way Was a tow-headed gal on a pinto It was jangling for old Santa Fe Yo-ho, it was jangling for old Santa Fe Women traveling the trail spoke of encounters with Native Americans as a natural part of day-to-day -day exchanges. They described Indians as helpful far more often than as enemies. July 15th. Some of the Indians came to our camp this morning. I swapped some hard bread with them for some good berries. Lydia Allen Rudd, 1852. Saturday the 25th. We left Walnut Creek at 7 o'clock and after traveling 10 miles crossed the Saline Creek. We then arrived at Kansas River where we halted a long time. Went into one of the Indian houses. The woman was pretty and spoke French. A man belonging to the fort was left dying of cholera at Walnut Creek. Anna Maria Morris, 1850. The difference between the emigrant trails, like the overland trails to California and Oregon, and the Santa Fe Trail is that the more northerly trails were for people traveling as families. They were going to establish homes in the West. They wanted to farm in the West, and some of them were, were gold miners. Those were the people who came mostly as single men. The Santa Fe Trail, on the other hand, was mostly a commercial and military trail, and therefore it has a reputation really of not having had women traveling on it. It's impossible really to, to wipe women's presence out on the emigrant trails, but a pretty good job has been done of erasing women's presence on the Santa Fe Trail. But they were there. There were certainly women traveling that trail. I've often been asked if we did not suffer with fear in those days, but I've said no. We did not have sense enough to realize our danger. We just had the time of our lives. But since I've grown older and could realize the danger and the feelings of the mothers, I often wonder how they really lived through it all and retained their reason. Nancy Snow Bogart, 1853. We identify mobility with men. We think men are the only ones who really want to move and keep moving. It's true that a lot of women have seen themselves when they had to travel along with their men because the men made the plans as kind of draftees in a male enterprise. But for other women, travel and movement was the adventure of a lifetime. A thunderstorm at sunset on the prairie is a sublime and awing scene indeed. The vivid and forked lightning, quickly succeeded by the hoarse growling thunder, impresses one most deeply of his own weakness and the magnanimity of his God. With nothing before or near us in sight, save the wide expanse of prairie, resembling most fully in the pale light of the moon, as she occasionally appeared from under a murky cloud and between the vivid lightning, the wide sea. 
Susan Shelby McGoffin, 1846. Women like to move too. They move deliberately, they move knowledgeably, and so we have to remember that women are travelers and not simply people accompanying the men who made their way west. Some Victorian women who went west perceived the element of the unknown as a peril to them. They were afraid that they were going to be swallowed up by the savagery and darkness they thought they would find in places where people like them had been accustomed to being before. Other women liked the idea that they were going to get surprised. They liked the idea they were going to see things they'd never seen before. This was a land of vast spaces and long silences a desert land of red bluffs and brilliant flowering cactus. This land belonged to the very old gods. They came on summer evenings, unseen, to rest their eyes and their hearts on the milky opal and smoky blue of the desert. For this was a land of enchantment, where gods walked in the cool of the evening. Marion Russell, 1860. Wagon after wagon was seen pouring down the last declivity at about a mile's distance from the city. To judge from the clamorous rejoicings of the men, I doubt, in short, whether the first sight of the walls of Jerusalem were beheld by the Crusaders with much more tumultuous and soul-enrapturing joy. Josiah Gregg, 1844. Initially, when it was opened in 1821, it, it connected uh, rural Missouri. Missouri was the westernmost frontier state in the United States at that time. So it, it connected a little town in central Missouri, Franklin, with a foreign capital, the foreign capital being Santa Fe. In between, there was virtually nothing. Fort Osage existed on the western border of Missouri, but beyond that, it was uh, it was all described as simply Indian territory, that is, the southern plains. So they arrived in uh, first settlements in New Mexico initially, were along the, the Pecos River, scant uh, 30 or 40 miles east of Santa Fe. The next stop was Santa Fe itself, and they were then in the capital of a foreign nation. The arrival produced a great deal of bustle and excitement among the natives. Los Americanos, Los Carros, La Entrada de la Caravana were to be heard in every direction. Josiah Gregg, 1844. This was quite exotic for the first traders that came over the Santa Fe Trail. Most of them had never been outside the United States, and it was, it was exciting. Uh, they, yes, they were going to make a profit, but they also signed up on these wagon trains for the sheer love of adventure. This was something new and different. A few moments more saw the wagons halted and ranged in the square, and one after another they were emptied and the goods deposited in the customs house. Evening scarcely darkened over the town before noisy American drivers were heard singing, shouting, and rioting in every street. The sound of the fiddle and guitar soon succeeded, however, and this drew the rowdy customers from the streets into the fandangos half a dozen of which are sure to be put into operation upon the evening of the caravan's arrival. Matt Field, 1840. Fandangos, as the term is used in New Mexico, is never applied to any particular dance but is the usual designation for those ordinary assemblies where dancing and frolicking are carried on. From the gravest priest to the richest nabob, to the beggar, from the governor to the ranchero, from the soberest matron to the flippant belle, from the grandest senora to the cocinera, 
all partake of this exhilarating amusement. Josiah Gregg, 1844. I often wonder how Americans first looked at it when they came into the area. I, I can empathize and sympathize with how Mexicans saw the Anglo-American coming in, speaking the strange language, expecting Mexicans to speak his language in Mexico. But I, I'm, I'm amazed and I often like to read the accounts of Americans as they come into the area. Their first reference to the New Mexicans as Montezumians living in tabernacles of clay. Friday, July 12th. I am not at all disappointed in the appearance of Santa Fe. It is the most miserable, squalid-looking place I ever beheld. Except the plaza, there is nothing decent about it. The houses are mud, the fences are mud, the churches and courts are mud. In fact, it is all mud. Anna Maria Morris, 1850. The Santa Fe Trail Bridge two worlds. In large measure, it's the Anglo world and the Hispanic world, but in another way, it's really the frontier of Anglo-America with the frontier of Hispanic America. They came into New Mexico, and they looked around them, and they said, my, isn't this place poor? Forgetting that they were on the edge of Mexico, not in its core. And I would think that Hispanics coming over the trail from Santa Fe to Missouri might have responded very similarly, arriving at the town of Franklin and thinking, is this the United States? My, aren't these people poor? The town is a wretched collection of mud houses without a single building of stone. And I compare it to nothing but a dilapidated brick kiln or a prairie dog town. George F. Ruxton, 1846. Hispanics were rather unknown to most people on the East Coast uh, because American history tended to move from East to West. When Anglo-Americans came over the Santa Fe Trail, they brought with them the heritage that, uh, that represented part of their English background, and that was a hatred for Spain, for things Spanish, that went back to the Anglo-Spanish rivalries of the 16th century, of Spain overrunning the Low Countries, of Spain threatening English survival. And that, that heritage would, became part of the uh, American, of American culture in general, permeating the little bit we knew about Spain, and then became transferred to Mexico. Those are all century-old attitudes that were born in Europe as a part of the Reformation, Counter-Reformation rivalry. The great uh, irony, in a way, of the Santa Fe Trail coming and meeting the, the Chihuahua Trail. Remember, the Santa Fe Trail reflects the East to West movement, Chihuahua Trail, the South to North movement, is they come together here in New Mexico. We're the hub of the re-encounter of these two old world rivalries, now changed over centuries, but still have vestiges of those rivalries. So you had two people coming together, bringing different goods, both working in concert at times, but also facing difficult, a difficult situation because of political ideology, attitude, and cultural chauvinism that has its origins in the 16th century with what we call the black legend or hispanophobia, um, refined through time in passage. The Spaniards had their own caste class system. The Americans had their unique sense of racism applied. And when they came together in this region, it was a shock for both sides. The women slap about with their arms and necks bare. If they are about to cross the little creek that is near all the villages, regardless of those about them, they pull up their dresses. I am constrained to keep my veil drawn closely over my face all the time to protect my blushes. Susan Shelby McGoffin, 1846. In 1821, it began. By 1824, the Mexican governor, Bartolome Baca, was sending emissaries to 
the United States to try to engage in trade relations. We shouldn't be surprised that there were people like Manuel Armijo and Manuel Alvarez and Don Asiano V. Hill and the Chacones and the Chavises and, and the Ortizes all trading on the trail. Uh, they were merchants before. They were trading south to Mexico. They were sending sheep down there and hides and uh, whatever else they could scrape up. Uh, some of them were doing fairly well, uh, you know, by New Mexican standards, uh, trading to, to uh, Mexico. And they'd been doing it throughout the colonial period. The Santa Fe trade is more like a, a spoked wheel design, with Santa Fe being the hub. One leg of it going with what we call the Santa Fe trade to the United States, but another hub breaking off and going to Los Angeles in 1829 and going further south into Mexico. The Mexican people in New Mexico, subsistence farmers and, and sheep herders, within two generations began to negotiate in world markets. Hispano merchants were very important, a very a significant segment of the people who are involved in trading. We know that they were sending goods to the interior of Mexico like they've done uh, throughout for 300 years uh, or as long as the New Mexico was settled. So they continued the shipments down what we call El Camino Real. And we know that after 1830, they're shipping uh, merchandise that you're purchasing from the Anglo merchants or the foreign merchants that were coming into Santa Fe. By 43, um, most observers will remark that most of the people on the trail are Mexicans. But Mexicans had been on the trail for quite some time. They began to traffic as commercial agents themselves, besides the muleteers and the packers. Many observers in New Mexico realized what was happening. They knew that it just wasn't trade goods. These people were coming in, they were marrying, they were purchasing property, there was conflict. Very often, these Hispano merchants had their daughters marry these American merchants. So. It's really a mutually convenient system uh, in which these Hispano Ricos really were trying to uh, control as much of the commercial activities in New Mexico as they could. Uh, the Santa Fe Trail is, has been known as a road that link uh, Missouri with New Mexico, particularly its capital, Santa Fe. However, it was oh, this is only one segment of what I would consider a large network of international trade, of commercial relations that involved Europe, involved the United States, involved Mexico. They are all adventurers who despise you as barbarians, weak-minded and corrupt men. They blaspheme your religion and scoff at your pious customs. They are grasping merchants who envy the fertility of your lands, the richness of your mines, and the clemency of your weather. Some are men who distinguish their fellow men by the color of their faces in order to impress the stamp of slavery on those who are not white. And they come to take possession of the land with their sword. Sister Mary Loyola, 1846. The American claim is by right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent which Providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty. John O'Sullivan, 1845. Essentially, manifest destiny held that Americans had the preordained, God-given right to expand their physical boundaries and expand their institutions clear across the continent. It was brutal in its disregard for the rights of others, although it was also liberal at the same time in that it presupposed the eventual extension of full political rights to the conquered people. In the mid-1840s, 
Americans began to see the nation as a country of the future. Expansion was a prerequisite to America fulfilling its destiny as an international leader. America is the country of the future. It is a country of beginnings, of vast designs and expectations. It has no past. All has an onward look. Gentlemen, there is a sublime and friendly destiny by which the human race is guided. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1844. By 1845, that friendly destiny was bringing American settlers and traders into and across Mexican territories at an alarming rate in search of gold and ports to the Orient. The destiny of the American peoples is to subdue the continent, to rush over this vast field to the Pacific Ocean, to teach old nations a new civilization, to confirm the destiny of the human race, to emblazon history with a conquest of peace, and to shed blessings around the world. Divine task, immortal mission. Let us tread fast and joyfully the open trail before us. Let every American heart open wide for patriotism to glow undimmed and confide with religious faith in the sublime and prodigious destiny of his well-loved country. William Gilpin, read to the Senate March 2nd, 1846. If we are not able to preserve the integrity of our territory, all this country would very soon be the prey of the greed and enterprising spirit of our neighbors on the North, and nothing would remain save the sad remembrance of our political existence. Governor Manuel Armijo, 1846. The United States in the 1820s and 1830s was marked by what was called the rise of the West, and we see it best expressed in the rise of Western politicians, William Henry Harrison, Henry Clay, David Crockett, and most especially, of course, Andrew Jackson. These men were self-made men, masters of the environment, masters of their own destiny. They represented a new type of American. In the past, Americans had been worried about the anarchy and the freedom that the frontier offered. Now they embraced it. It became part of the American mindset. And of course, part of that mindset was expansion, physical expansion, commercial expansion. They were determined to expand the boundaries of the Republic in a physical sense, and they were determined to expand the boundaries of freedom as they defined it. Jackson was committed to this, his followers were committed to this, no one more so than his protege, James K. Polk. The hardness of these Republicans does not permit them to look upon us as equals or as inferiors. Their conceit extends itself, in my opinion, to believe that their capital will be that of all the Americas. Luis Dionis, 1822. James K. Polk, elected president in 1844 on an expansionist platform, was determined to take New Mexico and California, was determined to take the Oregon country, was determined to protect the boundaries of Texas at the Rio Grande rather than the Nueces River, and was determined to do all this without appearing to be the aggressor. He had a real problem. Part of his way to solve that problem was to send an army down between the Nueces and the Rio Grande River, the disputed boundary of Texas, and leave it there as bait, hoping that uh, the Mexican forces camped on the other side of the Great River would come across and some act of provocation would result. And that's exactly what he got. The Mexican people themselves were tired of being pushed around by these foreigners from the north. They were in no mood to compromise, and they were in no mood to allow the Americans to take one more inch of their territory. And so the bait on the Rio Grande worked. A Mexican patrol clashed with an American patrol. Some American soldiers were killed, and Polk asked for a declaration of war to protect America from foreign invasion. American blood has been spilt upon American soil, he declared. And uh, off the nation went gleefully to war. We 
like to think that Manifest Destiny is a force of the 1840s, that it began about the time of James K. Polk, and indeed the term was coined in 1844, the term Manifest Destiny. But Americans clearly subscribed to such a view in the early part of the century, and that notion that they had of that it was their destiny to move all the way to the Pacific was fed by early Anglo-Americans who came into places like New Mexico and on to California or Texas and saw that these areas were sparsely populated by Hispanics. Certainly they were still Indian territory and Americans knew what to do with that. That would be an area to conquer. Hispanics had not conquered Indians thoroughly in this region. It was an area that awaited conquest from the point of view of many Anglo-Americans, and those Anglo-Americans who came over the Santa Fe Trail and saw this firsthand gave enormously credible testimony then to their compatriots that here was a place that was not only sparsely populated, but it was ill-defended, that Mexicans had not built impressive fortifications, the place would fall easily. And of course, they were right. For 25 years, the Santa Fe Trail was a road of commerce. By 1846, it was to become a trail of conquest. As Americans pushed westward, they expanded in different ways. In New Mexico and in California, they expanded with commerce. And the entering wedge is the trader who comes in, who opens up a commercial connection, and especially, almost in a sense, co-ops the elites of the new community. This commercial connection then, of course, uh, establishes the road that an army will later march across. June 30th. This morning, the troops marched off majestically over the green prairie. The long files stretch over miles of level plain or wind over the beautifully undulating hills with gun and saber glittering in the morning sunbeams and pennon proudly streaming in the breeze, while the American eagle spreads his broad pinions and westward bears the principles of Republican government. John T. Hughes, 1846. After a long march of 28 miles, we found ourselves in the high ground overlooking town, where we had to wait for the artillery to come up. They made their appearance, and we proceeded to take possession of Santa Fe. Second Lieutenant George R. Gibson, 1846. Mexicans, I have been sent by the government of the United States in order to take possession of the province of New Mexico. We come as friends to make you part of the Republic of the United States. In our government, all men are equal. Every man has the right to serve God according to his heart. We mean not to murder you or rob you of your property. Your families shall be free from molestation, your women secure from violence. My soldiers will take nothing from you but what they pay you for. Religion and government have no connection in our country. In our government, all men are equal. My intention is to establish a civil government on a Republican basis. Brigadier General Stephen Watts Kearney, August 18, 1846. From the Mexican perspective, of course, uh, people didn't really understand what Manifest Destiny was, but people understood what invasion was. Strange indeed must have been the feelings of the citizens when an invading army was thus entering their home all the future of their destiny vague and uncertain. Their new rulers, strangers to their manners, language, and habits. And as they'd been taught to believe, enemies to the only religion they've ever known. As the American flag was raised and the cannon boomed its glorious salute from the hill, the pent up emotions of many of the women could be suppressed no longer. A sigh of commiseration even for causeless distress, escaped from many a manly breast. The wail of grief rose above the din of our horse's tread and reached our ears. Lieutenant Richard S. Elliott of the Laclede Rangers, Army of the West, 1846.
question is, is it better for the Mexicans who were conquered by the United States, the 60,000 people who became part of the United States by conquest, not by immigration? My family didn't migrate, didn't immigrate, didn't cross into the United States. The United States came to me and my family. We were here. So I feel a sense of permanence. This long swoop of history comes together, and the, and the Santa Fe Trail is 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 that point is at at the flashpoint, a major part of our patrimony, a thing that to which we are as Americans, all of us, even the people who came from the South, uh, and and the people who went from the East to the West, all of us are trying to adjust to, is the marriage, the re-meeting of the descendants of those old world rivals, here. And what we bring to that meeting then is something new that we learned in our new world experience. And that, of course, includes the influence of the Native Americans on whose home ground this is all being played out. It, it's, 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 it's almost a spectacular swoop of history that lasts over 500 years and will continue. And it's something, it is a context that we in this country should understand even better than we do now, more than just acknowledging that happened, but understand that because we still carry, whether we know it or not, all of us in our cultural baggage, our mental makeup, prejudices that started centuries ago that are no longer useful today. The Santa Fe Trail gave many Americans who came to the Southwest an experience that's still useful for us. That is, it was a pathway to the world for them outside of their known world and into a new world. And at first, they were negative toward those people that they met. They were different culturally and racially than they were. But gradually, over time, they learned that those cultures were not less than theirs, but different and they gradually began to learn the importance of a sense of community. How important it is for us in the 20th and the 21st centuries to realize that the world is a community. And if we look at the former Yugoslavias, we realize the possibilities of what we don't learn about communities, ethnically and racially and religiously. The Santa Fe Trail opened a window of opportunity for Americans in the 19th century. If we learn from it, it can help us as we think about the 21st century.